A chronotype, um, like I said, is either, like, people have probably heard of it as early bird or a night owl, but this is actually a genetic situation where your body wants to wake up at a certain time and go to sleep at a certain time. And what we discovered is when you start to look at these four different types or avatars of people, once somebody um, identifies with them, there's a lot of stuff we know about them. Hey, healthcare providers, you're listening to the Burnt Out to Lit Up podcast. Hosted by myself, Erica, and my husband, Michael, we're an OTPT team that understands the healthcare industry's got some serious issues. Inspired by our own experience with burnout, we've made it our mission and passion to help you navigate your career in healthcare by cultivating wellness, growing both personally and professionally, and advocating for a better workplace. Whether you are a clinician or manager, new grad or seasoned vet, Join us each week as we share interviews, research, stories, and strategies that will give you the tools to go from burnt out to your most lit up self. Let's dive in. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought you were going to sneeze. You woke me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, well, welcome to the Burnout to Lit Up podcast. <laughs> it's funny because today's a sleep episode. Because it's National Sleep Awareness Week. Hooray. Well, it's coming to an end um, because it's Friday. But um, if you've been following along our Instagram and if you opted into the Thriving Collective newsletter, then you know all about that we are honoring Sleep Awareness Week. So super I truly exciting. appreciate sleep. Yeah. Yep. It's like, it's one of my favorite things. It's, like in life, actually, I it, think. But ever since I've known you, it's been your favorite thing. And I've always been like that. You've always From really like very sleep. small child <laughs> to thirty-year-old <laughs> child man. <laughs> child man. <laughs> no sleep. Like some people, you know, when people say like they don't really need sleep or they don't need much sleep. That's I don't. Crazy. I don't. I just don't understand that life because I'm super different. If I get. Six hours of sleep versus eight hours of sleep. Like, even that, I'm such a different person. Like, six hours of sleep is not good for me. And I feel so, like, body, like, every cell of mine feels rested when I have those eight hours of sleep. And lately, the uh, I've been falling asleep while I've been meditating. But meditating has gotten me to um, a... a state of like i'm Does ready help me i'm ready asleep. for sleep i always have had trouble falling asleep and now that we've been medic meditating right before bed it's like okay it's like winding me down because you're changing your brain waves like i'm my brain waves i feel like we're in beta like the very alert brain waves you know i was going through like what i did earlier that day and i was thinking about what i'm gonna do next week and next yeah. month and next year and then i just couldn't stop thinking but then like the meditating has brought my brain waves into like alpha and all those other brain waves um i know theta is um the brain waves you you, you use during sleep and relaxation and then delta uh, those brain waves are your slowest ones but i think meditating has helped me at night to like prep me up for, for better sleep for sure i fall asleep definitely easier faster for sure <laughs> yeah um you know the book we're listening to mm -hmm. um what's it called again? becoming supernatural yes Dr. becoming Joe supernatural Dispenza. um he talks about he went into a different like an altered state of being yeah so he like i mean apparently when you meditate and you get into your theta wave like sleep pattern or or, or whatever or, or meditate i don't know what you call it really but i think it's the theta waves that like you can have like vivid almost hallucinations like weird images and like scenes and stuff yeah i've never meditated and have hallucinated i've never like that has never no. i'm not sure not there yet. yeah we're very um beginner and even though i've been doing it for two years or more i would still consider myself to be not an expert in meditating by any means no i mean i just get i get tired when i meditate and it like breaks down for me but you're starting i, I wish i could do it in the middle of the day you know what i mean because i feel like that would be like my best time because i wouldn't be you tired have a good lunch break like you, you could do it yeah lunch but break. then i'll be all like calm and and stuff for i don't know i, I have to be like alert for work yeah you know? but you have an hour and a half for lunch like you can you can do it during your lunch break technically i have an hour 
and oh. then 30 minutes of documentation time. Oh, but my bad. Since I <laughs> do my notes really quick, I'm good. So. Yeah. Well, I want to know that, like, I have very vivid dreams. I always have. I've always been a vivid dreamer. And I remember my dreams in great detail. And people like you, you're not a vivid dreamer. You don't really remember your dreams. You Hardly ever. I've... I have, I've had like significant dreams where I, I remember I've held on to for many years. Like I remember some of the dreams I've had when I was five years old and. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. I and, wonder if I'll, if I'll dream or if I'll remember dreams more often now that I've been meditating. I don't, cause I never meditated, you know, when I was a kid or anything, but I've always had, I wonder what's the science behind that. I've always been interested in dreams, like always. And some of my... um, You have a good memory, though, in general. So maybe that helps because, I mean, you remember things from your waking life, like, really well. So... Yeah. I want to I wanna start that conversation in the group. Maybe we can start the group in Facebook with opening up into this conversation. Like, do you have dreams? Are you a vivid dreamer? Like, how have dreams impacted you? Because I know... I used to lucid dream, not anymore because I haven't, like when I was in seventh, eighth grade, I remember being intentional about I'm going to go to sleep and I'm going to be awake in my dreams. And I, sometimes that happened. I haven't done that in so long, but, um, I don't know. Actually, there have been times where I thought I was lucid dreaming and I wasn't, I woke, I woke up and realized I wasn't in control. Mm. It's, I've had really weird inception type of things happen before <laughs> I, I used to be able to do that when i was young i used to be able to know i was in a dream and then like change things in the dream but then for some reason as i grew up i, I stopped being able to do that you stopped I, dreaming i guess well no i'm sure i kept dreaming i just like wasn't no but i, I meant i meant you you stopped like dreaming oh i don't know okay well we got a quite a guest for you today. speaking of sleep and dreams um, Dr. Michael Bruce. So when I had this interview with We're him, punching up here at the Burnt Out the Little Podcast. We got <laughs> punching guys, above our weight class. We got the Dr. Michael Bruce. So yeah. after my interview with him, I had to leave the house um, and go to the library, and I uh, ran a, a stop sign because I really? I had just really? yeah because I had just interviewed him and I was so starstruck. Oh, I was God. still in like this different state of mind, and I I ran, I ran a stop sign. <laughs> I'm like I, I couldn't believe I had just interviewed the sleep doctor, Doctor Michael Bruce. He like he is BFFs with uh, Doctor Oz, BTW. Um, I don't know if they're BFFs, Ooh. but um, he's definitely he's been on his show, and Doctor Oz did the foreword of his book, The Power of When. Nice. Mm -hmm. Wasn't he on the Today Show or, or one of those shows? So he's he's done a million things. He's the author of Beauty Sleep, The Sleep Doctor's Diet Plan, The Punch Power of When. Punch he's done up. hundreds of presentations to Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies. Uh, he's the inaugural... Oh, I can't say that word. Inaugural? Inaugural Sleep Technology Ambassador at Health 2.0, put on by the National Sleep Foundation. He's consulted um, for many brands like Advil PM... Uh, Crown Plaza Hotels, uh, Disney, uh, Princess Cruise Lines, um, Sleep Score Max, and many more. He's a sleep expert on WebMD um, for more than 14 years, and he writes for the Insomnia blog, Huffington Post, Psychology Today, the Oz blog, you name it. If, if it concerns sleep, Dr. Bruce is on it. Um, He's the principal researcher on numerous grant-funded projects with clinical tri and clinical trials, and he's been interviewed on CNN, Oprah, The View, Anderson Cooper, Rachel Ray, Fox, and the Burnt Out a Little Podcast. Yeah, he's been on the Burnt Out a Little Podcast. He made time for us. Yeah. Um, talking to Mark, talking to Dr. Michael Bruce was a huge uh, pleasure and a huge honor. Very appreciative that he took the time to um, <laughs> come on the Burnout yeah. to Little podcast. Yeah, it was nice. For me. Um, I mean, when I was talking to him, like, sometimes I totally, like, blanked my for Like, you know when you, you're you talking or when you approach someone famous or when you see someone famous and, like, you forget your it's name? Like, I, I, <laughs> I forgot my name several times talking to, talking to Dr. Michael Bruce. Yeah. Um, he is super cool, and I've listened to The Power of When on Audible 
twice. Um, love. It's a good book. Love. His book has really influenced my work. I tell him that in the show. Um, he's a boss, needless to say. I think like, his, his work has the power to change how we feel about scheduling our work life absolutely and yeah and it's like yeah, i think it's really important for people to understand what what he talks about and, and you'll hear it in the interview where like mm -hmm. you know people you know that they don't all have the same peak times where they're productive right you might be like me where you want to sleep in a little bit and then you want to work later in the day uh or you know erica actually likes to get up a little earlier than me and she's like more productive in the morning so it's like those kind of things like you know employers and organizations they have to like get behind that kind of thinking you know absolutely because um i and dr michael bruce we both share the opinion um that any person that gives you advice that you must wake up at 5 a.m to be successful that's total bs that's um love that he doesn't tolerate that i'm a zombie like i'm, I'm from the walking dead <laughs> at 5 a.m yeah and there's a lot of guilt and shame and i've heard pretty successful People um, in business say this and it hurts because it's not based out of any science or evidence. It's just based off of maybe their lions and a lot of lions just think that it means you work really hard if you wake up early. Like, which, which may be true, but you're not going to be effective if you're not that kind of person. You, because there's different chronotypes, and he goes into that um, based on different animals. But, you know, some entrepreneurs can be lions, and they think the only way to be successful is this way, the lion way, which is early morning person. But you can be a wolf or, or any other of the chronotypes and, and be successful and make your schedule and uh, your routine based around your most alert times in the day. And just because it's later in the day or in the evening doesn't make you any less uh, successful. So dope. dope. Oh, We're excited right. to bring this to you. We're really excited. Really, really honored. Please I'm enjoy. having a, a moment. I'm blushing. <laughs> give, us a, give us a like on uh, wherever you're listening to the podcast. Share us with your us. friends. Share with your friends. I mean, if you haven't shared us before, um this episode i mean like just the sharing the news of chronotypes and this can really help people there's so much science behind this and the consequences of being misaligned um are grave in terms of your health um and there's millions of not millions but there's uh, many studies and dr michael bruce um has contributed to and other studies on the importance of chronotype and health so this is a great episode to share with your friends enjoy your work inspired me to create a whole module on sleep and energy um all right I love yes it. no i reference your work a lot and other articles on chronotypes so before we go into that i just want to hear about a little bit more about you so can you share uh, more about who you are and what you do sure sure so um <clears throat> I'm Dr. Michael Bruce. I have a PhD in clinical psychology and I'm board certified in clinical sleep disorders. So what that means is um, I took the medical board without going to medical school and passed um, and I've been practicing an actively practicing sleep specialist for <clears throat> the last almost 20 years now, believe it or not. Um, and I've seen every kind of sleep disorder that you can imagine. Believe it or not, there's 88 different sleep disorders out there um, and I'm pretty sure I've seen them all. And um, I've been fortunate. I've written uh, several books. My first book was called Good Night, and it was pretty much a do-it-yourself guide to fixing your own sleep. Uh, my second book was called The Sleep Doctor's Diet, Lose Weight Through Better Sleep. And this was all about the relationship between the metabolic process uh, and sleep deprivation. And then my most recent book was called The Power of When, and this was all about something called chronotypes. And so for people out there who don't know what a chronotype is, think early bird or night owl. I just expanded the categories. Uh, from two to four <clears throat> and was able to come up with some really cool science uh, about what time of day you should do certain things. Um, other than that, I do a tremendous amount of media and uh, I've been very fortunate to do work on lots of television shows and be out there educating people about sleep. So it's really become a real passion of mine. Oh, that's incredible. Um, yes, the Power of One um, was the book I, I consumed. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I know you have, you said 88 sleep disorders. Yes. Oh, wow. So what is some of your, um, what, what is the current work that you're involved in? So currently, um, I'm starting to look at cannabis and sleep. 
Uh, I'm starting to look at things like the microbiome in sleep and then kind of more health trends in sleep. So things like intermittent fasting, sugar, uh, paleo versus keto diets in sleep, th things like that. So really trying to understand how does sleep affect some of these new current health trends and in a pro or con fashion. Awesome, awesome. Um, so can you break down what is a chronotype? And actually, before you do that, by the yep. way, um, I've, been, I've been so aware of social jet lag once I hit my 30s. So <laughs> I have yeah. you to thank for, to, for bringing that up to my awareness. Um, yeah, so can you share what a chronotype is? Sure. So a chronotype, um, like I said, is either like people have probably heard of it as early bird or a night owl. But this is actually a genetic situation where your body wants to wake up at a certain time and go to sleep at a certain time. So not everybody was kind of created the same. So if you go way back into caveman days, what you'll find is that there were really three types of people. There were the hunters and they were the early birds, the, what I call the lions. They would wake up at, you know, before the sun would rise and start going out on their hunting. Um, then you had the bears or the or what's historically been called the hummingbirds. These are the people who wake up around seven o'clock, they go to bed around 10, um, and they're kind of the villagers and take care of the village. <clears throat> and then you have the sentries or the, the guards, and these are the night owls um, and what I call a wolf. Uh, what I did was I added insomniacs to that mix because there are definitely some genetic propensities for people with insomnia. And what we discovered is when you start to look at these four different types or avatars of people, once somebody um, identifies with them, there's a lot of stuff we know about them. So as an example, lions make up about 15% of the population and um, they are my COOs. They are my make a list every day and um, you know go from step one to step two to step three on the list. They are very regimented in their thinking, um, almost militant in a way. They don't necessarily get work done, but they're really good at managing people to, to get work done. Um, and um, they are my early morning people, but <clears throat> the evenings are not so great for them. Um, dinner and a movie is out usually for a lion because they're, they've been up since 4.30 in the morning. Like they're exhausted. They want to go to bed. Um, the bears make up about 55% of the population or so. <clears throat> and um, these are my extroverted, more outgoing types, generally speaking. Um, not all of them, but generally speaking. Um, these are the people who will invite you to their home for dinner or buy the drinks at the, at the bar type of person. Um, but they, they do get work done. These are the worker bees, if you will, and the people who can kind of make things happen. The wolves, which make up about 15%, and I'm a wolf, by the way, um, we're the night owls. So uh, we have a tendency to be the creative. So we're the artists and the actors and the authors and those kind of people. We actually tend to be introverted, um, <clears throat> it, which is odd for many of those professions. But, uh, but once we're on stage, we're a completely different person than we are in real person. Um, but wolves really have it tough. Uh, we have the highest rates of suicide. We have the highest rates of depression. Um, we have the highest medical issues. Um, <clears throat> the world is not kind to, uh, to people who like to stay up too late, unfortunately. But again, this is a genetic situation. And then there are the dolphins. So my dolphins are my insomniac group. And I really wrote The Power of When primarily for, for them. But um, <clears throat> one of the things that we know about, and the reason I chose dolphins, by the way, all the animals that were chosen actually follow the circadian rhythm that they represent. So lions are in the early, bears are in the middle, wolves are nocturnal. Dolphins are interesting because they sleep unihemispherically. So they only sleep with half of their brain at a time. So the other half is awake and looking for predators. And I felt like that was a really good representation of what my insomniacs go through. So they make up about 10% of the population and they are really like lions, but with OCD. So they like to make a list every day, but they're highly anxious individuals. Uh, many times they would prefer to sit in their cubicle and do their work by themselves than do anything that's really particularly social. They oftentimes have medical issues um, and oftentimes um, are uh, self-diagnosed as insomniacs. And so those are the four avatars, if you will. It's fairly easy to discover which one you are if you head on over to my website, thepowerofwhenquiz.com, you can actually um, take a quiz, it takes about two minutes, and you will learn more than you ever want to know about your chronotypes. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that's important is twofold. Number one, once you know your chronotype, it starts to teach you when to go to bed and when to wake up, uh, because that can be different based on who you are. Um, and then number two, 
Um, it also can give you some hints as to when is the best time to do certain things during the daytime. Uh, in the book, I list over 50 different activities, so I can teach you the best time of day to have sex, eat a cheeseburger, ask your boss for a raise, you name it. That's great. Yeah, I love I love all that, all those things that, that are in the book. And um, I will link everything in the show notes for sure so people can uh, take your quiz. Um, okay. I've had friends and family members take your quiz. <laughs> Um, I, huh? I sat with my in-laws for an hour and a half diagnosing them <laughs> and I knew what yep. they were before I even knew their sleep, how their sleep patterns were, uh, according to the quiz, just based off of their personality. So do you see a strong link between chronotypes and personalities? I do. Um, and in fact, so in some cases, I don't even have to have people take a quiz. I just talk to them for three or four minutes and I'm like, yep, you're a dolphin or yep, you're a lion. And, you know, it doesn't take much to figure it out. The, the personality characteristics appear to be fairly distinct per chronotype. Right. Cool. Yes. Oh, now I will tell you one thing that I've noticed happening uh, since we've been running the, the study or, or rather the, the quiz is the bear population, which is the largest one. One out of two people is a bear. Um I've learned, I think, that there are early bears and there are late bears. So there are people who like to go to bed early but still fall into the bear category, and then there are people who like to stay up late and still fall into the bear category. Oh, that that's interesting. I've had, for, for myself, I know my sleep patterns are more like a bear, but I'm not a lion, but I have some lion tendencies, so I was kind of that a little... So you could be an early right. bear. I, th I think so, yeah, yeah. for sure. And th th that makes sense. I know bears account for 50% of the population. The 9 to 5 was created for the bear. Yep, yeah. exactly. Um, so what are some of um, the biggest disruptors of our chronotype? Well, um, I think we are our biggest disruptors of our chronotype um, because a lot of people don't even think about it and they just wake up and go to sleep at the same time like everybody else. And what they don't realize is that there's a real advantage to knowing and understanding your chronotype, number one. Uh, number two, um, we expose ourselves to bright light, and that can shift our chronotype pretty dramatically. Um, you know, most people think, well, if I uh, if I take melatonin, that's going to be the big factor in shifting my chronotype. It turns out that light is a very big factor in this, and um, it can certainly be something that can be difficult for people, um, especially if you're getting light exposure at times when you want your your chronotype wants to go to sleep. So, as an example, if you're a lion, and um, you work until 10 o'clock at night in a brightly lit place, you've got a bad job time and too much light exposure, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, actually, um, <clears throat> in healthcare, since I'm an occupational therapist, I recommend that a lot of lions start um, those early hospital morning shifts around 7 a.m. and that yep. um, bears and wolves can work an outpatient where you can start at 11 or 12, for example. Exactly. That's perfect. That's exactly how I want the book to be used and the information. That's perfect. I oh, love great. it. Um, so, you know, talking about chronotypes and aligning with your chronotypes, after I read the book, I was, um, well, not too surprised that um, I, I was out of line at the time. And many people m you may be finding are misaligned. So what are the, some of the biggest consequences of being chronically misaligned? Oh, gosh. Well, so we'll, this happens to wolves quite a bit because they're really the chronotype that kind of gets beat up the most because we want to sleep until 10, 30, 11 o'clock and then work until midnight. And, you know, the rest of the world doesn't doesn't do that. What we've seen um, with the misalignment uh, really is um, depression, uh, elevated levels of anxiety, <clears throat> um, slower healing, weight gain. So all the things that you see happening with sleep deprivation you'll see with misalignment of your chronotype. Um, and, um, you know, some people are now thinking that <clears throat> you could have an increase, depending upon your chronotype, you could have an increased risk for certain diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that. So it's, it, we're still early in the science to know everything there is to know. And of course, uh, many people don't know this, but the Nobel Prize for Medicine this last year was actually given to circadian researchers. So, you know, circadian science is making its way into the field, thankfully, um, but we're still not quite there in terms of understanding everything there is to understand. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, during my own research, I've come across studies that support your, your book in, uh, in terms of how screen time can even uh, affect um, chronotype. Yep. So do you have anything or any research on screen time and how that can negatively impact us when we're trying to get better sleep? Yeah, so there's a lot of data looking at the effects of blue light on sleep. And so if people go over to my website, which we'll give you in the show notes, but it's thesleepdoctor.com, you click on the blogs, 
um, and you just type in blue light, <clears throat> you'll learn quite a bit about how what is blue light, how does it work, um, and uh, what's what's going on there with it. Um, my biggest uh, thing that I like to do is to talk to people about blue light blocking glasses, um, and um, that seems to have a tremendous uh, effect uh, on people in terms of. Um, their ability to still function at night. And so, unfortunately, I couldn't find any glasses that I liked, so I made my own. So um, if you want to check out uh, sleepdoctorglasses.com, and we'll give you a discount code for the um, for the glasses, it'll be sleepdr25, and you'll get a 25% discount code. Um, those have been extremely helpful for me. Uh, I have my family using them. I have a lot of my patients using them, and that's certainly something to uh, figure out. Great. Yeah, I've been I was going to ask you about that because I've been hearing about those a uh, type of glasses a lot and I was going to ask you what you recommended, but that's perfect. Um and I'm trying to get my husband on board <laughs> with this whole concept of the the blockers. Yeah. They really do work. I mean, the science is clear. You just have to make sure that you've got the right lenses. Um I have uh C39 amber lenses, which are the ones that are known to block uh the most blue and green light. Um, between 440 and 490 nanometers is the wavelength of light you want to block. Um, and they seem to do it quite well. So whatever glasses you get, make sure you get the right lenses. Great. And is there a certain time during the day where you should put them on? Yeah. So you should um, you should put them on approximately 90 minutes before bed. Great. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to talk about some common mistakes people make in terms of trying to combat exhaustion from this um, because of poor sleep quality. And we think of the things like, you know, waking up and drinking coffee or having our sugary snacks or like the things that I remember I used to do to give me energy, but clearly didn't work. So what are some common mistakes you see when you're working with sleep clients? You know, I think um, there's a couple of very common mistakes that I see. I mean, one is exposure to blue light at night. We've kind of gone over that a little bit. The other is just a lack of consistency in their wake up time. I don't really care what time you go to bed, but I really care what time you wake up. And you need to wake up at the same time, both during the week and on the weekends. That turns out to be a very critical um, aspect of what's going on and certainly something that I think people will um, understand more about, you know, if you wake up at the same time, it, it sinks your circadian rhythm every morning. So, you know, like one of the things that I talk about with people is consistent schedule, but I, I actually have a five step method, um, that I'd like to share with your listeners if I could, that really can, anybody can do starting tonight. And it's all things that will help improve your overall sleep quality. Is it okay for me to oh, yes, lay it absolutely. out there? So step one is to keep a consistent wake up time, which we've already discussed. Um, step two has to do with caffeine. And so I ask my patients to stop caffeine or go decaf by approximately 2 p.m. Uh, the reason I chose 2 p.m. is because caffeine has a half-life of between six and eight hours. And so th if you go decaf by two, then you've got at least half of the caffeine out of your system by 10, which is around the time that a lot of people are going to bed. And it should be much more successful. Now, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's listening and saying, you know what? I can have a cup of coffee um, right before bed and it doesn't have any effect on me. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that we do know that there are different people who have different sleep um, or rather caffeine sensitivities. Um, so some people are more, you know, eat a Hershey's Kiss and are up for 48 hours. Some people, you know, can have 12 cups of coffee and go right to bed. Um, but when we look at somebody who's had any coffee uh, within three to five hours of bedtime, what we discover or actually closer to eight hours of bedtime, what we discover is that the quality of their sleep is not very good. Remember, sleep is not just a quantity game, but it's also a quality game, and it's something that people really need to think about and is important. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's what I've been focusing on. We had little bright lights around our apartment, like from the cable box and other things that we blocked, because I know those can interfere with your sleep, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the third step is um, alcohol. So I ask people to stop drinking alcohol approximately three hours before bed. So it takes the average human body approximately one hour to digest one alcoholic beverage on average. And so if you have a couple glasses of wine at dinner and you stop dinner at eight um, and your bedtime is 10, you've got two hours for two drinks, you're in great shape. The other thing I ask people to do is to drink one glass of water for every glass of alcohol. This slows down the sheer volume of alcohol, but more importantly, it keeps you from getting dehydrated, which is a big concern 
for um, for most people um, because uh, alcohol. The two reasons that you get a hangover is lack of deep sleep. The other reason is dehydration. Mm. So that's a big factor. Um, step number four has to do with exercise. I'm a pretty avid exerciser, and so one of the things I ask people to do. Um, is to exercise daily because you can improve your sleep quality that way. But you really don't want to exercise within about um, within about four hours of bedtime. That seems to be uh, where the disruption can occur from exercise. So what I'm always, oftentimes asking my patients to do is exercise daily, but don't exercise roughly four hours before bed. And then the last thing um, is I ask all my patients to give the sun a high five every morning by standing outside for 15 minutes or standing in front of a window with, uh, with sunlight uh, within about 30 minutes of waking up. And what this does is it turns off the melatonin faucet in your brain. So blue light in the morning is good. Blue light at night is bad. And so we have to have light in order to reset our circadian timing and that's an easy way to do it yeah i love that i i remember that when i wake up every morning um <clears throat> i try to expose myself to light first and then i'll have my coffee in mid-morning um so mm -hmm. i love that advice um you know in terms of something that's been bothering me and i'm sure that bo that may bother you is this advice that in order to be successful you must wake up at 5 a.m so can you share your thoughts around that i think it's total yeah. bullshit so Here's the problem is if you're a night owl, which again represents 15% of the population, there's no way you're waking up that early, number one. The only people that can wake up that early and be successful at it are lions and early bears. And again, we're not talking about a tremendous um, section of the population. We're actually talking about a uh, small section of the population. But what everybody seems to think is if I just get up earlier and get up earlier, everything's gonna go better. Number one, if you're not a lion or an early bear, you're not gonna be able to think very well that early in the morning, and you're certainly not gonna be able to get um, a lot of work or productivity done. So I, I find it amusing, um, and I have written comments to many of the uh, authors of those articles that I've seen saying, you're completely missing all about chronobiology and chronotypes, and you're giving everybody these false ideas, and people are tr killing themselves to wake up this early, and they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people, like, well, before I was familiar with your work, I felt bad about myself because I didn't like to wake up at 5 a.m. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I knew I had a feeling you would have obviously strong opinions <laughs> on that. Um, I have some strong opinions. I apologize. Yeah. But um, so for someone that is a bear or a wolf and they're feeling this pressure like, oh, I got to wake up at 5 a.m. to be successful. Um, where what part of the day is are they most um like primed, you know, accordingly to the chronotype for, for success. So, you know, if you're a night owl like me, really you start to hit your stride in terms of productivity. There's two, you have two kind of peaks. One will happen at around 10.30 to 11.30 or so, and that's kind of your first little burst of energy. Um, then something else seems to happen somewhere in the three to five range. Um, it just sort of, again, this is all based on hormones and your uh, overall hormone um, excitation and de-excitation or the uh, production or, deep, uh, or uh, elimination of hormones throughout the, the body during certain periods of time, right? And so um, adrenaline, cortisol, those are all hormones that work on a 24-hour functioning scale and, um, and, and it's all based on your chronotype. So that's how you kind of start to understand and determine, oh, where are the times where I'm gonna be able to focus better or be able to read more detailed information or make better decisions, those types mm -hmm. of things. Yeah, I love it. Um, you know, as far as the golden question, I'm sure people are thinking, um, A, can I change my chronotype? And, and B, is there one chronotype yep. better than the other? Sure, so the answer is no, you cannot change your chronotype. These things are genetically predetermined. Um, as a matter of fact, if you did 23andMe or Ancestry.com, um, you can learn what your chronotype is. As a matter of fact, I'm, I, I did 23andMe, and 23andMe actually has a morningness and eveningness report that you can get to learn more about yourself. So that is, is it's genetic based. But that being said, you can force it into a different chronotype, but you have to do it every single day. And you'd have to do it using light therapy and melatonin, the same way you would use those things for jet lag. Mm. So it's really much more advantageous to kind of go the way Mother Nature made you, which is your chronotype. Um, so that's number one is in terms of changing it. What was the second um, question? Is one better than the other? 
Yeah. So I would argue no. Um, I don't think there's one that's better than the other. I just think they are what they are. Uh, many people think that there are advantages to being a lion, and we've got uh, somebody coined the term lion envy <laughs> um, out there um, because they felt like lions get up at 4.30 and they're so productive and all this stuff. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is every chronotype has its pros and cons. Um, when you talk to a lion, one of the first things they'll tell you is, my social life stinks because I can't go out past 8.30. You know, and so there's a lot more to it, I think, than sort of meets the eye. And that's one of the things that people have got to start, you know, understanding a little bit more of. Yeah, everyone has, I'm sure, envy of another type, but we all have our strengths and we all have things that we can yep. work towards. Um, like you said, the lions. I had a, I have a lion friend that she likes to go to bed at 8 p.m., <laughs> you know. Um, so I know we all have our, our strengths. Um, and I know. And you mentioned chronotherapy as something that is gaining major credibility as a therapeutic option to treat cancer. So I was really interested in that. So I just wanted to ask you, um, as we wrap up, how does chronotherapy work? Um, so it's interesting. So uh, I, yeah, I just posted, a, did a series on cancer and sleep. It was a four-part blog series on cancer. And um, it, it's pretty interesting. There's now data to suggest that um, during the 24 hours in which you receive chemotherapy, if you if you receive it based on your chronotype uh, at a particular time in that um, in that 24 hour cycle, not only do we need less chemotherapy, but we're also uh, finding that uh, it's more effective. So it's pretty amazing, um, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the studies that you have in, in your book, in terms of just the the timing of of um, certain medicines or therapies, um, even food consumption, just it was about the timing more so than the actual um, th thing itself. Um, say that last um, part again. Like a, a lot of your studies in the book were more so about the timing of um, administering uh, certain medicines or even when, when to right. eat versus the actual yes. su uh, substance itself. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's it, so it's interesting, depending upon the studies that you read and, and, and the literature that you look at, the chemo itself is chemo, right? But when you administer it, you what you can end up doing is needing less of it um, over the course of time if you're administering it at the right point in the circadian cycle. Oh, that's incredible. I know one of your latest um, blogs was on this, so I'll I'll link everything. <laughs> I'm going to link that as well. Cool. Um, so one last, yeah, Thanks. of course. Um, one last thing for sleep hygiene practices. Is there any other thing that we haven't touched upon that any chronotype can apply to improve their sleep hygiene? Yeah, so one of the things that I recommend is that everybody should do um, uh, what I call a power down mm -hmm. hour. So one hour before whatever your bedtime happens to be, based on your chronotype, um, you should break that hour up into three 20-minute segments. So 20 minutes to get stuff done that you just have to get done, 20 minutes for hygiene, and then 20 minutes for some form of meditation, relaxation, prayer, watching TV, doing a crossword puzzle, whatever it is that gets you to calm down and relax. Because remember, sleep's not an on-off switch. It's more like slowly pulling your foot off the gas and slowly putting your foot on the brake. There's a process that has to occur. And uh, that becomes very, very important to, to give yourself the time to do that. Yes, yes. I find that when I just go to sleep after being busy in the kitchen or whatever, it takes me much longer to fall asleep. Absolutely. Oh, oops. Oh, sorry. My doorbell rang. <laughs> um, That's so okay. where, I know we, you mentioned the sleep doctor. Um, where else can people find you? So um, the easiest place to find me is www.thesleepdoctor.com. And then I also own the social property. So if you want, you can follow me on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram. And they're all The Sleep Doctor. And you just look for information. Um, if people come to my website, you can sign up for my newsletter. I highly recommend taking my quiz. You'll learn a whole lot about yourself um, and uh, hopefully help out somebody else. Mm -hmm. Great. So I would like to end um, with my signature question. What is your most lit up self? My most lit up self. What does that help me understand um, what that your, means? Your happiest, your most joyful self. Oh, what is it or what am I doing when that um, happens? What are you doing when that happens? So um, usually it's when I'm with my kids. Um, so there's three different times that I really feel like I can kind of just do my happiest self. One is if I'm running. 
So I'm, I like to work on my running times and I live by the beach here in California. So it's great to have the opportunity to be able to run um, by the water. Uh, so that's one time. Another time is whenever I can hang out with my kids, whether it's going out to dinner or playing guitar or just hanging out and watching TV and listening to them. Um, and then um, the third time, which is just kind of fun for me, um, is I'm a poker player and I love to play poker. And so that's certainly one of my more fun times. It's more fun when I win than when I lose. I will. Tell you <laughs> I've that. been wanting to learn how to play. So thanks for reminding me. Uh, oh, it's oh, awesome. Great. Well, thank, thank you again so much. I appreciate it. And thanks for being on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.